200. It's incredible. So you do 100 and, 100 and something. 90, yeah. So I literally pulled up the audio book today, put it at 2x, and was just reading along Jesus. on the audio book. As you went. But I did it, and I understood like 80%. That's the best part about this book is that it's very fun and you don't really have to have, you don't have to grok it fully every single time. Uh, so what was the last thing that you read? What was the last thing that happened? Um, I guess the captain of the old ship comes to this guy's uh, palace in wherever he's at. And then he's like, you need a warrant, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, we're going to arrest you, we're going to arrest Jillian, we're going to arrest Michael Smith. And he's like, Michael, go hide in the pool. And Michael's like, oh, I get it. Like, everybody is God. That's the, that's the last thing. Okay, you didn't. So he's still in the pool. Yeah, and so I peeked at the sentence after that, and it was like, Valentine Michael Smith was swimming or something. Yeah. So I think some shit's right about to go down. Yeah, you kind of stopped about three pages before, like, the first action sequence, I would say. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really funny. But no, that's good. Yeah, uh, the last, I mean, the last week, I also fucked it up, all of the last recording. I think it's Valentine Michael Smith. I was calling him Michael Valentine Smith, whatever. John Jacob, yeah. Jingleheimer Smith, doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, it was... Uh, Fucking, I don't even remember what happened at the end last time. That's where he swallowed the first guy. It was the end of the last time we broke. Not swallowed, he made the guys disappear. I think so. Yeah, I think that's where we stopped. So, we learn that, well, really, she remembers that, well, she being Jill remembers that, uh, Ben was talking about Jubal Hershaw, Harshaw guy, and said he would take him in. So she brings him over to, I don't know, like billionaire guy's house. And he's... Yeah, Har Harshaw, yeah. They just pull up, and she basically says, I've got, I've got the man from Mars. I need help. Nope. Ben said you'd help. And he's just some old head sitting at the pool. He's got three hot uh secretary girls just chilling uh -huh. chilling at the crib he's got some other assistants and shit he's kind of got a sweet pad um so they pull up he's like a doctor half doctor half lawyer guy who's retired and just chills now but everybody knows him and so she thought he could help out and then he kind of just mm -hmm. takes him in he won't admit it but he thinks it's kind of sick that the man from Mars is there. Um, yeah, that guy, Harshaw is an interesting character because, so I was on Google and I was like, the intro to him was really fast. So I was like, okay, who is this guy? And then everybody was saying it's the author inserting himself into the story. And so mm -hmm. I think Harshaw is meant to be, who's the author of the book, but I forget the name. Robert Heinlein. Yeah. He's meant to be that guy. And that that made it really cringy for me because I was reading like, oh, he's got three babes and they're his secretaries. And he's like, you know, talking to um, Jillian all sexist like. And I was like, dude, this book is freaking dated, but yeah. it's okay. And I was like, okay, it makes sense. The, the author just made him like a cool, wise guy who like keeps inciting the action for the rest of the story, I guess. Yeah, I didn't, I guess I didn't read it as the author insert. I just thought it was another, like you said, it's definitely dated, another old whatever, but just, he seems chill. <laughs> I don't know. He's <laughs> like really a chill wise, I think it's like a very like Obi-Wan and Luke Skywalker, like chill wise guy guiding cool. this person. Yeah, I get it. I That does make a lot of sense if that's the author's self insert older guy who can still he still got it yeah he's like i love women and i'm rich and yeah. i'm a writer 
Yeah. So like, just, just send the, the books, like, just send it to the people. And she's like, you write such awful things. Like, I like how that. Do you come up with that. He's yeah. Like, Fuck you, bitch. She's like, I hate you. He's just sitting there at the pool, and as soon as inspiration strikes, he's like, come here. <laughs> Fucking remember this. Yeah. Hey, remember here. this. Front. Right here. That was pretty funny. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, they arrive at his mansion. He basically just takes him in, no questions asked. He doesn't really give a shit. Um, and then they kind of just start. He says he doesn't want to do experiments, but he basically just starts socially experimenting with Mike. I thought that was cool when he was. So when when Jillian brings, is it Jillian or Jill? Jill, yeah. Or, or Jillian. You pick, brother. When, when Jill is like, hey, by the way, this guy touched people and they disappeared and they start experimenting with um, how that works. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can make things disappear if I feel that they're bad. Hmm. That, I thought that was a really cool part of the book this morning when I read all of it right huh. before the call. All at once. That was, yeah, that was really cool. That was a cool part. Right? You kind of did like, the was... high school thing of like, oh, fuck, we were supposed to read 20 pages and just cranked it out in the hallway. I cranked it. So it's fresh in my mind. I Perfect. Guess that's better. I mean, it's not a bad thing at all. But yeah, he's, uh, that was definitely like the highlight of the of this section was, I mean, I don't like how you phrased it. He touched the dude and he disappeared, but <laughs> it was like, <laughs> yeah, when they were back at, um, when Jill and Man from Mars were back at Ben Oxton's apartment, it was where they fled to immediately after they kidnapped or she kidnapped Mike from the hospital or saved him from the hospital. Two dudes broke in. Well, not even broke in. They like announced themselves as police, came in with guns and shit, and we're gonna take Mike back basically. And they were pointing guns at Jill, and Mike just made them disappear with his mind. And freaked the fuck out of Jill because two dudes just completely disappeared into nothing in front of her before they had a chance oh. to shoot her. Um, and so she was telling this to Hershaw or Harshaw. I thought it was Hershaw until page 219. I read it okay. as I saw there was an A instead of an E. But I was like, <laughs> whatever, not that big a deal. But yeah, then they basically just got him in the living room and she was telling Harshaw about it. And he's like, okay, well, let's see what the limits are. He's asking Michael how he does it. And he's like, yeah, anybody can. Like, it's not a big deal. Any Martian can do it. If it's not right or if there's wrongness in it or whatever, I will make it go away. And so what's the first thing? They have Jill throw a box at Harshaw's head. Like an ashtray. He's like, okay, throw this ashtray at me. Yeah. And Michael's freaking out. He's like, why the fuck would you do that, yeah, dude? don't do that, dude. Terrible. Please. <laughs> I'm going to hurt this guy. And he's like, well... It's bad. Um, you're going to have to make it disappear. And then the other one was a gun. And that was cool. So he whipped out the gun. And he's like, I'm going to pull this gun out. And you need to make it disappear before I aim it at you. Because it's yeah. bad. And that was that was cool. I can see how that sets up for action sequences later Definitely. on. Definitely. Yeah. Because I wonder who, what kind of guys might have guns. Mm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was kind of sweet. It was like he could... Lift objects with his mind. He could move them around, let it hover. Um, basically, what he did is he had the fair witness, which is Anne, I think her name is. One of the secretaries has, like, this total recall power, which is, like, this guild of people that live on Earth now that you have total recall, and you can remember every single last detail of everything you've seen. But, like, to be fair, you can't form any opinions on it. You just recite exactly what happened. So he has her go total fair witness mode. She's watching. And then they set up like four cameras with a bunch of angles so they can watch too. And then they make Michael pick up an ashtray, move it around with his mind, hover it in midair. They see how many things he can pick up at once. He gets like five pieces of stuff and just having them float midair. And then, yeah, they start asking him to make other shit disappear. And then when they're looking back at the tapes, they're saying from any angle you're viewing it, it looks like the thing is either getting really small or the thing is like moving away from you until it gets really small and then it just disappears. From any angle, it looks like it's moving very far and fast away from you. So I think this dude has like fourth dimension. That's what I was thinking. Somehow I saw some parallels to Dune with 
the the truth sayer people and also like the goaded male protagonist. I feel like mm. the more science fiction we read that's gonna be like a increasing trope of like, okay, there's this different government. Yeah. And then there's also this sect of people who we use in the government extensively. And I mm. saw a lot of parallels between like the truth sayers in Stranger in a Stranger Land or Strange Land and then Dune with the Bene Gesserit where they're like, Okay, you know, we're gonna verify this person saying the truth. Yeah. So I thought that was that was interesting. I don't know which one came first, but I feel like either one copied from the other with that. Well this was sixty cool. one. I feel like Dune was also sixties, like sixty four or something like that. I don't know. Um, you want me to fact check on that? <clears throat> yeah, Jamie pulled that up. Yeah. I'm yeah. seeing it right now. Dune nineteen sixty five. I was close. Um, but yeah, no, definitely they. 1961. So, Hey, yeah. Always something to have. There's gotta be people have to get better. You have to have some superhuman people doing some shit. I don't, I mean, it doesn't explain, it hasn't explained yet how they do that or why they're able to do that, but they just figured it out. It's cool. It's very cool. Um, <clears throat> I also really liked the part in this where towards the end of this section, like, page 170, 190, or something like that, when he was talking to Duke, the dude who, like, ran the cameras and shit, and he was talking about how Duke was like, I'm not going to sit at the same table with a guy who, like, wants to eat people. Oh, that's what it was. So after they did the having Mike move shit around and making shit disappear, and they looked at the cameras, um, they then Hersh Harshaw did the, like, I'm going to pull the gun on you and make it disappear. And then Mike... They were talking about, like, Mike, if one of them dies, whoever dies first, the other should <laughs> partake of them to grok them fully, which I thought was intense. Uh, Ishan, you still there? Rose Frozen? Hey, there he is. My laptop, I think, overheated and died. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsies. All right. Sorry about that. Can you, you... How's this? Works for me. <laughs> um, what was the last thing you heard me say? Um, just start with the thought over. Okay. So I thought it was interesting where after they made Mike f move a bunch of shit around, after they looked back at the footage, maybe before they looked back at the footage, but they were, after Hershaw pulled the gun on him, Mike was talking like, whichever one discorporates, whichever one of us discorporates first, the other should partake of them and grok them fully to appreciate <clears throat> like what they Oh, were. yeah. So yeah, they, they eat each other. Yeah, Mike was like, I would want you to eat me, and I'm going to eat you if you die, because that's how much I respect you. And Harshaw yep. was like, thanks, I guess, dude. Like, okay. <laughs> um, it would be then, cool. I feel like we should do that. Oh, if it... No. <laughs> I, have, I can't even, like, justify it. It is it is weird as fuck. It's really, really strange. Uh, but yep. their whole, like, life cycle is, like, completely different. Where when the Martians die, they don't... Like, that's not their end. They just become like a ghost that you can still interact with or like a, I don't know, like a force ghost or some shit. Mm -hmm. So like if they discorporate or whatever, it's not a big deal. Everybody's like happy about it. Cause now he's just gone on to be an old one or a ghost or something like that, but you can still talk to him and like get advice from them. Um, and so for them, it's a waste of food. If you let somebody die and then not eat them. And then it also is like, allows you to understand them more somehow. Um, so for them, it's like this total ceremonial thing, totally normal, where it's like you're appreciating the other person for having lived in the physical form. You're like, to better grok them, you have to eat them. And so it's just yeah. weird as shit to Harshaw, who's like 
cannibalism is it's fucking weird. It's weird for people. And so he's talking to Duke about it later, who like ran the cameras and shit. He's like the IT guy for Harshaw. And Duke's like, I'm not going to eat at the same table as somebody who wants to eat people. And they're talking about how, like, from Duke's perspective, and from, like, even my perspective the whole time, too, it was like, yeah, he's c- completely uncivilized. He's like a baby. He's like a complete, like, alien monster. But then Harshaw's like, no, dude, I think we're the uncivilized ones. Like, he's got it figured out. He's got it completely figured out, and we're still catching up. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Where they've got, yeah. I mean, the dude could make shit, move shit with his mind. He can slow his own heart rate down. He can do all this crazy telepathic stuff. Uh, he's communicated with things that have died and gone on, but are still ghosts. It's crazy. Um, yeah. They also talked about the, this is before, but they talked about how <clears throat> humans weren't the first intelligent species that interacted with Martians. That was strange. That I was like, wait, how many other aliens? Because I don't, I don't remember the exact passage, but he was like, oh, you know, there are eight planets and five of them are inhabited and the fifth planet got blown away, but they interacted with Martians. And I'm like, yeah. is he talking about Jupiter? Because that's gas, you know, like nobody lived there. I don't know what the fuck he was on, but. I think what he was saying was there was a fifth planet between Mars and Jupiter. What's that asteroid belt? It's like Kepler or something like that? No, it's it, there's the asteroid belt and then there's the Kuiper belt, which is outside of Neptune. Oh. Hmm. Well, well, the, well, the one between Mars and Jupiter is just called the asteroid belt. Okay. So he what they were saying is that the asteroid belt was a planet. Yeah. So before it was asteroids, it was a planet, and they had sentient life, and they visited Mars... And the Martians grokked them fully. They fully understood everything they were about. And they're like, well, we have nothing more to learn from you. And they blew their planet up. (laughs) And then that turned into the asteroid field. That was, okay, that's an interesting idea for the asteroid belt. Uh Uh-huh. It's strange. We've we've landed on on an asteroid on the asteroid belt now, which is crazy. And we've blown up an asteroid in the asteroid belt with... A satellite or a probe or something, we which is pretty great. We grok it, bro. Dude. Yeah, dude. We we stay grokking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty wicked. So the Martians, we basically have learned, are like all-powerful, like insanely powerful. Um, they have all these insane powers that Michael doesn't fully understand and that all the humans in the book have no fucking idea what's going on. I thought it was cool how... When they were talking about how he was with the Martians and they were like, yeah, sure, go with them and see what you can understand. Mm, Yeah. We don't really care. They were like, yeah, we don't really care, but come back and report what you find on Earth. Yeah. And they were more concerned with this weird art project that they were doing on Mm -hmm. Mars. And also in the society, how I guess they're immortal or something. And they were like, yeah. There's really no need for haste in the Martian society. We just kind of take our time and figure things out. And I guess that happens when you're immortal. And it's there was a point made by the author about how, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but how human culture is driven by our sexual difference. So like males versus females. Yeah, he's and that's why dichotomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why we have everything that we have and why our culture is the way it is. That's an interesting idea. I don't know if I agree with it, but it was cool that that was brought up. Yeah, everybody's always running around. Our society is completely based on fitting as much shit into your 70 to 100 years as you possibly can. Um, And then it was also talking about, yeah, I mean, like the... I mean, you have... Only some of that time is you're fertile, basically, to be able to pass on your genetics. Um, mm-hmm. They were talking about that, but it's like if you're a Martian or something, you have the life stages, but there's not really an end in the same way. And that the stages, so the initial stage, everyone is female, and then when you grow up, you become a male. Yeah. 
which was really strange. Hard. I don't think that popped through. <laughs> yeah. Difficult to grok. Very, very difficult to grok. Dude, not, me and my boys are trying to grok. I have not grokked fully exactly what's going on. Not grokked rightly. But uh, they basically just keep having Michael read shit. He has, like, he already has the perfect memory. Like, he already has this total recall. Like, everything he reads, he can completely 100% recite it. Uh, yeah, he files shit away for later consideration, which is cool. I do like that. I wish we could do something like that. I mean, it's almost like you can for dreaming or sleeping or something like that. But if yeah. you actually had... If you... <laughs> if you had the capability to actually, like, when you're sleeping, go into your mind and sort through shit. They say that your brain does it automatically. Like, if you have an issue, go to sleep, and your mind will kind of ruminate on it, and you might have an answer when you wake up. So we have a very, Not very true. basic version of grogging, I guess. <laughs> um, I guess I'm a dumbass. That's never happened for me. No? Oh, no. Enough. No. Um, but yeah, it's like... Uh, he's cool. He's very, very cool. He reads all this stuff yeah. really, really fast. He starts to get a better grasp of the English language, but he still doesn't have the context for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. He kind of knows what the word is, but he doesn't exactly know what it means. They had to teach him what a gun is and stuff a few times. They were also talking... Mm -hmm. Did you get to the part where they were... They were talking about the religious group and stuff, right? Yeah. I saw... I read that, and I was like, oh, that's where this is going. Like, it's going to be... Uh religious it's going to be a commentary on religious institutions book mm. so we'll see if i'm right about that but i read that and i was like oh, okay this is going to be a you know joel austin bad individual uh, enlightenment good book mm. so we'll see i'm throwing the prediction out there so we'll we'll, we'll watch all of these later and we'll see if i'm right <laughs> yeah come back I didn't mind Harshaw's interpretation of all this stuff. Like, even he was saying, whatever, he's agnostic about it. And he was talking to Mike that everybody has their own truth and they're all speaking as if they fully believe what they're talking about, but nobody really knows. We don't have any old ones to consult about what happens after we discorporate. And Mike was having a hard time understanding that. Um, they were watching, <clears throat> Mike was watching a uh, television program basically of like this crazy Christian sect that um, they had one dude who basically predicted his own death or like sacrificed himself or something like that. And then now their whole thing is that they're saying they have a direct line to heaven and anytime you want to go to heaven, you just pray with us and we'll tell you when it's your time and you will kill you and you get to go to heaven. And so mm -hmm. he's watching this and they're saying, okay, Arthur and Dottie, your prayers have been answered. It's your guys' time next week. So we're going to kill you. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. They're all like loving it. And Mike's like, this is, this is sick. This is awesome. Yeah. They're going to become old ones. And so he's like super hyped for them. And Harshaw kind of has to explain like, it's different for us. But Mike doesn't yeah. quite get it. And he's like, let me go talk to these people. Let me go ask them because they can talk to the old ones. Like, I'll just ask them what happens after you die. Like, we'll, we'll have the answer right now. And Harshaw kind of has to go pretty deep into it. But I didn't mind what they were talking about religion. It definitely wasn't like a Reddit atheism. Like everybody who like, like worships these things is stupid. It, Harshaw was like, everybody, it all seems to have merit. I just don't know which one to go for. I yeah. like that. So definitely wasn't cringe. It didn't make me. It was good. And for no, it wasn't cringe, but it was, it was on the cusp of of, cusp of cringe <laughs> yeah borderline borderline cringe I, I don't know it's different dude this how it's let's see this was written in the 60s so it's been 60 years 63 years yeah uh, dude and that's from publishing I mean the dude was probably writing the fucking thing for five years yeah so I I think some of his takes stuff like that I mean that's still a debate today it's i mean we're no closer to any finalization and a lot of people still think that way too so i thought it was very interesting where you have takes 
like that that are could be still modern and then juxtaposed with Harshaw calling everybody sweet foots and shit like that. <laughs> like, hey, get over here. Listen to this. Dude, yeah, just the just the three chicks in the pool. Yeah. And they were all different body types. I was like, yeah, this was written at that time. I was like, of course, dude, this is just ultimate male fantasy yeah. writing. I was like, okay, of course this lawyer, our doctor, writer, like knows everybody, knows who to call guy yeah, is going to be a huge part of the story. I was yeah. like, okay. I don't mind it. You got to have the wise old man, hero's journey or something like that. Well, um, wise, yeah. You said it before where like you have to have the goaded male protagonist, but it's, I don't think Michael's definitely different. Um, it's so far removed from our society. I don't know. I mean, it's a, he doesn't have quite the same moral morality or anything like that. It doesn't really make sense to him about making somebody disappear or anything like that. I mean, he does it to protect his friends and shit, but he's definitely weird. It's definitely different. It's not the standard, like, like when we were talking, like we should read Ranger's Apprentice again or something. Yeah. One of those young adult novels where the dude starts off, he sucks and he gets some special training from some total beast and then he becomes insane, like totally sick. And then uh-huh. has to show off his new powers in front of everybody who thought he sucked before. Yep. Um, Mike kind of started off already so far above everybody else. And they kind of have to work with, like Harshaw said, it's like Superman. It's uh-huh. like Superman, but he didn't get raised by humans. He got raised by fucking aliens. And then now, mm-hmm. thankfully, is a decent enough guy. And... Thank God you can be his water brother and he just won't totally smite you. So it's interesting. Yep. They've got, he's got somebody under his house who's, as far as they know, completely all powerful and could destroy everything because they don't know the limit to his power really right yet. What he can and can't no. make disappear. Yeah, they've just established that if he thinks it's bad, he'll, he can make it go away. So it'll be cool to see where this goes, definitely. I agree. I'm kind of having a hard time understanding. I guess what we read here is that Harshaw tried to get aligned to like the king of the world, the secretary general, who I, as far as I can tell, is like the top dog in the entire yep. world. He's like the mm-hmm. leader of the federation or something like that. So he was trying to call up to him and he kept just getting whatever secretaries and fucking assistant secretaries and secretaries to blank, you know, whatever. He couldn't get the direct line. And then he called the police, like super secret police guy. And then that dude wanted to come bust down his door. Yeah. That's what I didn't get is how did those, how did those guys show up at the end of near page 200 where, how did he, how was he like, okay, Michael, you need to go hide right now. That's where I was lost, is how did these guys show up? So, Harshaw knew pretty early that they were going to figure out that he had the guy at mm-hmm. some point. And so Harshaw called, like, all these media dudes a couple, like, a few days in advance, like a week in advance. He said, you guys are going to want to have cameras around my house 24-7 because they're going to come and try and, like, raid my house and take the man, the real man from Mars. He didn't say that part, but he said, you're going to want to have cameras around my house 24 seven because something's crazy is about to happen. Um, and so he called, he called all the way up, tried to get to the secretary general. And then I don't really know how they deduced that then like Jill was there and that he might have Michael, but the police guy that he called and gave him so much shit, just got all the boys and was like, we're going to Harshaw's house right now because he's such a dickhead. And I think that because he's trying to get to the Secretary General, he must know something crazy. And he also asked about um, Berquist. And Berquist is the guy that got disappeared by Mike. Mm-hmm. And so I think because he asked about Berquist, who they knew died trying to go and get Valentine. Oh, okay. They got the, the warrant then. Yeah, they're like, all right, he must know something. So then they pulled up on him. And that's 
pretty much where you left off. So there's like a shitload of police in two hover cars that just landed at Harshaw's crib. And he had the total witness or the fair witness. And he's like, get your robe, get ready to watch everything. Has Michael Hyde at the bottom of the pool because he can just shut his heart down and not drown. And then Mm -hmm. he tells everybody else, start going in and out of the pool. So when they're way up there, they can't see how many people we actually have. So they won't notice that somebody's missing. And then yeah. that's where we stop. All right, dude. I'm fucking, I'm excited. I'll see how this goes. I know you're a little bit ahead, but. I'm on, um, like, yeah, 20 pages or something like that. 10, 20. Yeah, maybe I'll get there tonight. But if not, then definitely tomorrow. And we'll chat. We'll do another book club. Take your time. See how it goes. I like this one. It's whimsical. It's pretty fun. It, yeah, it is very cheeky. It's a very cheeky book. 